Welcome everybody, welcome to our live webinar session hosted by Narcos University in collaboration with Jaime Kessa, the former chief education evangelist at Google and digital education expert. He is joining you live from Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, it is about 6.30 a.m. there. I'm joining you live from Abu Dhabi United Arab Emirates. It's 5.30 p.m. here, and we have our crew in Almaty, Kazakhstan that is manning the technology. We are so excited to host all of you today and um, to have a great discussion about the future of the global workforce and digital technology and how education is a very important part of that. Um, we frame this discussion amidst the global pandemic that is happening. Um, so we look forward to having a really engaging discussion today. Uh, we welcome about 40 different industry experts in Kazakhstan from private organizations, consulting firms, um, startup companies, NGOs, um, development organizations. So we're really excited to have all of you to here today. We encourage you for the next 45 minutes that we'll be together to type in the comments section so you can ask any questions and give any feedback as we have this discussion. Um, without further ado, I would like to introduce Jaime. As I mentioned, he is former chief education evangelist at Google and a digital education expert. He brings several years of experience to us today. So welcome, Jaime. Good morning from Phoenix, Arizona. Good evening to where most folks are. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Pleasure, pleasure. So we'll start out the discussion today um, with a very direct question centered sure. around our current global pandemic. Um, so first question is, what were the biggest opportunities in digitalization and the future of the global workforce pre-pandemic that industry needs to or needed to better capitalize on now? And how has this changed because of the pandemic? Yeah, that's a great question because digitalization and let's define that right so to me digitalization is encompasses everything right so we're talking about artificial intelligence machine learning ar vr uh robotics automation all those things together artificial intelligence those that to me is all digitalization and change no matter what context you think about it in change happens gradually and then suddenly Right? You, if you look back at any change, there's a gradual progression to it, and then it suddenly changes. And so what the pandemic did to digitalization is it caused suddenly. And what I mean by that, if you think about digitalization, we think that it's a big part of our lives. We think, you know, we're having this conversation, you know, there's digitalization and everything. Everyone's using artificial intelligence. You are on your phones all the time. We think digitalization is a big deal and a big part of our lives, especially for young people who don't know what the world is like before all this. And what we need to recognize is that we are at the very, 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 very beginning of this. And, and when I mean very, I, I hope I'm emphasizing how beginning we are. For example, one, you know, most people think that the whole world is connected and online. And reality is only 50% of the world is online. Two, we are just starting to figure out how to use these tools. For example, Google just had a breakthrough a couple months ago before the pandemic about on, on the, the whole concept of quantum computing, right? They had a breakthrough in quantum computing. I'm not going to get into the definition of what it is, but Here's the breakthrough at, so that most people can understand what the breakthrough is. If you took a mathematical equation, one of the ones that you they use to spin numbers forever, if you took that mathematical scientific equation and fed it to a supercomputer, the world's most powerful supercomputer, it would take 10,000 years to process the equation. That's why they use lots of supercomputers. But if you took one, it would take 10,000 years to process that equation. The breakthrough that Google had, and there's other labs that are doing this as well, IBM, Microsoft, they all, they're all working on this. But the breakthrough that Google had, and I think they were the first, 
was that they, they could take that same equation and do it in 300 seconds. 10,000 years, 300 seconds. What's in between those two things in terms of capacity and capability and what we can do? We're talking Star Trek stuff here, right? We're talking Star Wars. That's, that's why we are at the very, very beginning of this. Now, when you think about digitalization as a concept, again, it's changed gradually. You can say 40 years back when, uh, when you went into factories and you saw people building cars, for example, and how that gradually changed to now you walk into a factory and it's mostly machines making machines. And, and supermarkets, and you can use a supermarket as an example because that's something that we all know. The, the technology, you know, 30 years ago was a, a labeling thing, right? Where you labeled cans of soup and put them on the shelf. And then the technology was a cash register, right? That you push numbers into. And then it became an electric cash register. And then it told you how much change to give. And then, and then we got the scanner. So you didn't have to put, you know, food label or you didn't have to put prices on things. You could just scan things. And then that had shifted recent, before the pandemic into self-service where you could check yourself out. And then Amazon said, well, why do people need to check anything out at all? Why can't you check yourself into the store, grab what you need and then walk out? And, and that's their stores that they have, their pilot stores that they have set up. So that gradual change just in supermarkets has, was before the pandemic. What I think is that you're gonna start seeing a hyper growth when it comes to automation, digitalization, computer science, those things. And the reason why is because if you're a business owner and you think about, especially a big COO of a company, and you think about your number one risk factor, you know, these, this is something you have a conversation about all the time. What's our biggest risk factor this quarter? What's our biggest risk factor this year? The one thing that nobody really thought about, and when you think about the pandemic, the biggest risk factor are people people gathering in places, people gathering to do work, whether that's a factory or a supermarket or a store or a, a warehouse or, or a call center, like the people gathering became a risk and a big risk to your business. So what you're gonna do if you're a good business owner is you are going to focus on trying to eliminate people as much as you possibly can from your processes. Right, that's just, that's just the way it should be. And so all of a sudden now, you're gonna see this growth in digitalization because we have to figure out how to solve those problems to eliminate risk, because that's what a company does. And the people risk is the biggest thing that we've discovered in the pandemic. So you're gonna see more. So supermarkets, like the idea that you're gonna walk into a supermarket, grab what you need and just walk out of the store because it's, all, because it's gonna be scanned, right? You're gonna scan yourself into the store with your identification, you're gonna, everything's gonna be uh, labeled and you put in and then you walk out and it scans you like in Star Wars. That's just a matter of months, right? Like stores in Singapore and, and, and in South Korea already are doing no people search, no people check out. People are already doing check out with machines. Movie theaters in Korea are all now automated concession stands. Like, this is only in a couple of months, right? So imagine what it's gonna be like in a year. So the opportunity is how, to, how do you take digitalization and apply it to current risk that you have in your business? And that, that's just one thing. Now, when it comes to education, when you think about that, what we need to think about as a whole is that digitalization means that if we're teaching students skills and things that machines can do better, are we doing them a disservice? And that what we should really be focusing on is helping them build human skills. And that's what businesses are gonna need. Like the digitalization stuff's gonna get taken care of, right? There's been lots of smart people working on that. What businesses need to focus, focus on with their workforce are the human skills. Problem solving, critical thinking, collaboration, the ability to learn, creativity, those are the things that companies are gonna look for because digitalization is gonna take care of the process work. Yeah, you touched on some really important parts, Jaime. I mean, talking about the quantum leaps 
you know, no pun intended with using the word quantum, but the quantum leaps that we've made in technology just in the last two years of, of humanity, it's huge. And right. as we've seen really in, industry is, is not reaching where we're at with technology. Um, and neither, neither are most universities worldwide. And I think that's especially um, present in emerging and developing economies. Well, mm -hmm. university, let me, let's, let's talk about that for a second. Cause universities, what, what I'm working with a number of universities here in the US around their value proposition. What is their value proposition to the world? And you touched on some of that, which is to get to some of that research and build some of that technology and create hubs of innovation to be able to take that quantum leap, if you will, in technology and digitalization. That's part of it. That's the industry side. On the people side, what one of the big things that they have to focus on is helping build human skills, helping them build innovation through human behavior. And so focusing on on that for students, for example, let's say, come here and we're gonna help you be a better problem solver. And no matter what the subject is, no matter if you pick accounting, like we're still doing programs, right? We're still doing that, you're in accounting and you should have a, a you know role related knowledge, right? You should have a track, but the reality isn't you're gonna come here and get an accounting degree and you're gonna be an expert in accounting. The, 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 the value proposition is you're going to come here and you're going to be a better problem solver and you're going to be able to collaborate. You're going to be able to think better and you're going to be able to be more creative. Like that's the value proposition that universities need to focus on. Definitely, definitely. I would agree. You know, I, um, I failed to introduce myself at the beginning. So I'll use this opportunity now that we're talking about universities to do so. So I'm the globalization advisor and I'm a senior lecturer in the business school at Narcos University. And I bring two decades of work in higher education. I've worked with institutions and in, uh, over, uh, you know, institutions with people from about hundred different countries and over 300 different institutions. And we do have a trend of very uh, powerful higher education institutions focusing on digital learning and innovation and emergency. All right, so it looks like uh, we lost Katie there for a minute. And I assume that I'm still uh, on. I, I'm, oh, Katie. Entrepreneurial skills that we really need in every industry. But many when we have crises in the world. Hey, Katie. To really transform how. We're, um, so with that being said, five, six months of a pandemic, nonprofit, startup, and kind of telltale signs or. Did you guys hear me okay? I think hey, we Katie, had it. A disconnect. You're up a lot. All right, let's wait for the connection to catch up. Okay, you're good now. I'm good now. Yep, sound good now. Okay, so um, I think I, the connection got a little, little funky when I was talking about that. What I've seen in my experience is there are some key, very powerful institutions of higher education in the world that are really grasping this moment of transformation towards digital literacy and those skills we need moving forward. Um, but many institutions are not. And so my question to you, Jaime, is during these six months or so of the pandemic, have you seen any kind of exemplar institutions, whether it be corporations, startups, nonprofits, higher education institutions that are really doing some groundbreaking work despite a global pandemic? Yeah, that's a great question. And it, it's a hard question to answer only because there's like two mindsets, right? There's the mindset that is, oh, this is going to go on for four years. So let's prep and do that. And then there are people who think about it like this is going to last a week and a half. So I'm just going to like take my time with this or, or just kind of stall, right? And that was, that's what I noticed is that there were two mindsets. I honestly, you know, it's funny. I, I was out yesterday and out in public and you see people with masks and you see two types of masks. 
you see the, I invested in a really good mask and I have like a branded thing and this is my thing. And, and it's, it, it was like $10 and, and it's expensive or whatever. And then you see the people in just like the throwaway 39 cent, you know, blue and white mask. And I think that that tells a lot about the person, right? The, I think the person with the good mask is someone who's like, hey, if we're going to do this. We're going to do this right. And, and we're going to be in the long haul. So I'm going to get something that I can use all the time. The people in the blue and white masks, the throwaway masks are like, oh, this is temporary. Like, I'll just use this until it stops, right? I tend to be more in the, like, the throwaway mask camp. Like, I just, like, I have the, I have a stack of them in the car and I use one and I throw it and I throw it in the back of the car and because and, I still feel like it's temporary. And in the long term, that's what this will be, right? This will be a, a blip. Right now, it feels like it's going on forever. It's now six months when I thought it was going to be three, like many of us thought it was going to be three weeks. So the way businesses, for example, have responded to that has, have been interested. Everything from companies like Google, you know, um, trying to plan ahead and, you know, figuring out what their, their culture is going to be like, because it changes dramatically. Google, for example, is not a work from home company. They are a collaborative, be in the same place, that's why we give you free food. That's why all the free stuff is there. We want you and, you know, they, they, have a, they, they run one of the biggest buses, co bus companies in the country because they go all the way to San Francisco, pick up their employees in these big luxury buses and then bring them down to Mountain View two hours later. Like they really work on putting people in the space together. They spend millions of dollars. And then you go from that to the next day where everybody is remote. That's a huge hit not necessarily in terms of productivity, but in terms of culture. And so how do you adjust that? And I think, you know, I, I've been gone for about a month, but until that point, I think Google did a really good job not missing a beat, like understanding what was coming and then jumping on board and going to this remote work model and saying lately that nobody has to go to work until next July, I think it's what it is. So everybody, they're, they're planning out. So now they can focus on, well, what does our culture look like between now and then, and what is it gonna look like afterwards? Other tech companies like Twitter and Facebook also reacted really well and said, now we are a work from home company and second uh, in-person company. Other, other organizations didn't, right? They, they all of a sudden you started seeing uh, articles and people complaining about their bosses tracking them and you know making them stay online all day because they didn't trust them. And it says a lot about your culture depending on who you are, right? Like it says a lot about how you hire people if you feel like you need to track them all the time or they need to be online all the time so you can see what they're doing, right? So there's been a lot of like revelation, if you will, inside corporate America about what people are good at and what they're not. And I think that's gonna be studied in business school for a long time, right? That, that how people react, how organizations reacted to the COVID. Universities on the other side, I've seen everything from we're not shutting down, la, 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 we're ignoring this whole thing, to ASU, I think, did a marvelous job of saying, no, we are going to open in the fall, no matter what, we are opening, and started planning way ahead of what that's going to look like. So they went worst case scenario, and they were right, right? This is back in March, where they thought every, you know, this is going to be a pandemic, and it's going to be in Arizona, and Arizona is going to be as bad as New York. And so they started planning for that. And so they set up structures and places and classrooms and on, they were already a big online campus. So they set it up so that they can deal with the pandemic and still have a school, right? And so they did extraordinarily well uh, setting that up. And then governments, you know, on a, on a global scale, lots of countries, you know, did the right stuff when it comes to the pandemic. They, they, they funded, you know, the economy. They funded people to have money to, you know, pay rent and supplies, and and they did all the necessary health things that they needed to focus on, which was, you know, the 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 testing and the and the and the fever checking and the contract tracing, right? And and they managed it. The best the best the worst thing that's come out of this is how bad the United States was at this. And how bad, uh, you know, us as a leader in this country or in this world at things like this actually is. And I think that just kind of woke up the whole world to realize, like, I don't know why 
we think they're the best country in the world or why they think they're the best country in the world because they're really not. And so I think you see a lot of that happening. And what is the implication of all that long-term? What does that mean to global trade? What does that mean to where the economy sit? What, is, what does that mean to where products and services are built? All that is going to get reshuffled, I think, over the next 20 years because of this pandemic. Sorry, do you hear me okay? Yeah. All right, good. We're having a little lag in, in connection there. Yeah, you know, you touch on such critical points. So what we've seen in the last six months, people really using their organizational skills and the organizational culture to um, plan for what's ahead, right? And others who are taking the, um, the slow route, right? And so we really have a big... Um, a, a lot of examples here of how to react, right? In the case of crises and challenge in organizations. I wanna go back to what you mentioned at the very beginning about the value of face-to-face -face interaction and person-to-person -person interaction because um, right. that is an area of a big discussion when we talk about digital literacy and the current generation of youth that are in undergraduate studies, most of them, including in Kazakhstan, have all grown up with a computer or a cell phone. And they're very used to communicating on, through a digital device. Um, yet, culturally, most of Kazakhstani culture, face-to-face uh, -face communication is very important, especially when deal dealing with older generations. So I wanted to see, get a little bit more detail about your thoughts on the importance in the workplace for that face-to-face -face and person-to-person -person interaction. And now that really the history will change forevermore because of this experiment in remote work that the right. world has faced, how can organizations kind of look at things differently, um, but also what is the value of this face-to-face -face interaction? going forward? Yeah, no, that's a great question because I think things definitely are changing and will change and we're going to have a different work world. And so a couple of things about that. Uh, so before the pandemic, while I was at Google, 12 out of my 14 and a half years or 12.5 12 out of my 14 and a half years, I actually work from home. I work from a studio. I was a remote worker. If you go to my YouTube channel, as a matter of fact, a couple months before the pandemic, I did a video on how to be a good remote worker. And again, change happens gradually and then suddenly, which was in that video, if you watch that video on my YouTube channel, you'll see that I talk about how there's a trend towards uh, working from home and the numbers are going up and the, the, that people want to work from home more. And like you saw those numbers trending upwards across the board and now change happens suddenly, right? And so this is the world that we live in now. So. I've been doing this from home for two, 12 and a half years. And because my team is based in one location and I'm remote, I get to experience both. And I can tell you that there's pluses and minuses to both worlds where remote work, you get to feel like you get more productive, you get more done. But in, in the in the in-person world, you feel like you have more spontaneous meetings. You feel like you get you have an idea and you can go talk to someone about it. It's a lot harder to, to do that when you are online and, and you ping somebody on chat and you're like, hey, you have a minute, it just takes longer as opposed to running into somebody in the hallway or talking over coffee. It's just, it's a different experience. And so the answer for me is, isn't necessarily one or the other, it's how do you do both? How do you combine those? Because at the same time that I got that when I was there the first day, the second day, I'm like, this is insane. Like people interrupt you all day. You can't get anything done. You're, you know, you're, you're always, you know, people are always talking to you. You end up spending three hours talking about a baseball game where at home when you're working, you don't do that, right? So all of a sudden there's pluses and minuses to both. So it's a combination of things. Understand that this is all for knowledge worker, right? You can't remote work cutting down a tree and logging it out, right? Like you just, you can't do that, right? You can't get five people on a Zoom call and shut and cut down a tree, right? It's just not possible. And so 
the physical world will always be there because people have to work together on stuff. At the same time, I think it'll be a hybrid. And I think you'll see technology that helps us do that. Where how do you and I, if we're on the same team, feel like we're in the same room or have an experience that feels like we're sharing? And the truth is that I think you can do it right. And, and I think virtual reality is gonna be a part of this. I think, you know, uh, remote cameras that let you, li you know, link in and talk to people where if you just had a camera hanging over you, I couldn't see you, but I could ping you and be like, hey, are you there? Can, can I talk to you? And then you hit a button and then, your, and then your thing turns on and we can just talk, like things like that, I think you'll see more of, but, but tools that help us feel more connected. But I still think at the end of the day, getting people around a campfire uh, and telling stories is where creativity happens, where collaboration happens. And I think that will always be the case. So I think it'd be a hybrid of both models working together. Hmm. Very interesting, yeah. And you know, it's interesting when I put it in context of Kazakhstan and in my experience in the last year that I've worked here is a lot of communication happens face to face and never before in Kazakhstan, have we had this sort of um, digital work environment? Mm -hmm. In the U.S., every place I worked, I always had colleagues remotely. I had, you know, in Washington D.C., the entire district works from home on most Fridays. You know, so that that is more of a part of the culture in the U.S., for example. But in Kazakhstan, it's a very very new concept. So it will be interesting to see how things shift in, in Kazakhstan moving forward. Um, on that note, I also wanted to get your thoughts on specific industries. So on the call today, we have people from oil and gas industry, hospitality, management and tourism, um, global development agencies, universities. How might this be different depending on these different sectors. As you mentioned before, you know, somebody cutting down trees, that team has a completely different experience than knowledge workers, right? right. And so in the world of, of higher education and global development, we have to think about how are we preparing everybody uh, and how are we preparing our knowledge workers to also support and help all workers thrive once they go into the workplace and are working with all levels of people. Right, and I, and I think it's an important distinction, which is it depends, right? It depends on the industry. And even in the industry, it depends on the role and what you're doing. But fundamentally across the board, whatever industry you're in, and I said this earlier, is we, everyone's responsible for education. You, If you're in the business sector, if you're in the workforce development sector, whatever, whatever sector you're in, just leaving education up to educators isn't good. We, we all have to work together on defining what education is because the education models that have been created in the world worked really, really well for about 150 years while the economy was what it was, where it was more of the people needed to work together more of a factory model, more of a warehouse model, more of a building kind of model. That, that's the world that we were. And the education system served that very, very well. So to me, what we need to do, and it continues to do that, it, but that's the thing. It's, it's set up for that world. We've been talking today about how the world is dramatically different. So therefore, what we need to do is think about what the education models need to look like for this future, for this digitalized economy, for what's coming up for the problems that we face in the world. And so what we need to make sure we do in education is ask ourselves, understand the future, understand what we're doing, and then ask ourselves, do we have the right model for that? And the answer is we don't. And so what we need to do is build that model. And, and I said this earlier, but if we're teaching students, if you, have, if you are an educator, if you are a parent and your kid is learning things that machines can do better, or will do better, you're failing your kid. You, you just are, right? I think about my five-year-old and every day my five-year-old wakes up, I want her to be a problem solver, critically a critical thinker. I want her to be able to know how to learn. 
I want her to be creative and I want her to be able to collaborate and solve problems, right? Like that's what I want her to do. The subject doesn't matter to me. The idea that she's gonna go study world history sometime in school and, and learn things without building those skills and then we're gonna test her to see if she's memorized those things is insane to me, right? Like that doesn't, think about like, study a chapter, memorize these 10 things, and then go and take a test to see if you memorized it. How does that help you build the skills that we just talked about, right? And so it's important to understand that if we're teaching students things that machines do better, then we're failing them. And what we need to do is double down on those human skills. This, and you know, oftentimes the narrative is digitalization and robotics and automation are coming to steer your jobs. And, and the truth is, I don't think that that's how, how we should look at it. That what we should do is think about the digital skills and the human skills working together to solve problems, just like we're doing this, right? We are having a human interaction. We are having a human discussion inside a digitalized world. And I think that's what we need to focus on are those human skills. And so those human skills is what universities should be focused on. Those human skills is what the workforce should be demanding. Those human skills are the ones that we need to make sure our universities and our school systems are focused on. And there's things that we can do in the business world to guarantee that, which is don't look for grades. Don't look for transcripts. Look for these skills and assess students who are coming in after their, their graduation on those skills, not on whether they have a piece of paper or whether they have a certification in some program more focused on those human skills because it's not the matrix, it's not machines versus uh, humans and you know where they're gonna fight to the end and see who, who takes over the world. It's about those two things working in collaboration, working in, in not competition, but working with each other to solve problems. And so I think if we focus on that in our schools, we'd be great. And I think the first place to think about where we can focus is around the ability to learn. We have taken um, we have taken this idea that our students don't know things, and so we must teach them these things. When the reality is, they know lots of things. That they just might not know things related to the things that you want them to know. And so, how do we make sure we focus on the ability to learn? For example. Um, many of you, if I, many, I hear this from adults all the time. They say, I'm not very creative. Or they say, I'm not good with tech. I hear educators say, I'm not good with technology. I'm not very tech savvy. And I respond with, and this is why I don't have a lot of friends. I respond with, no, no, it's not that you are bad with tech. It's not that you don't know how to use technology. It's not that you're not creative. It's that you've chosen not to be creative. You've chosen not to be good with technology because everything that you need to learn to be good with technology is out there. Everything that you need to be more creative is out there. You're choosing not to do those things. And that's the power that we have with education today is that everything's at our fingertips. Our whole world is there and so we can learn anything. So we need to get that mindset into our students so that they feel like there's nothing that they can't learn how to do if we can teach them how to learn. And it starts with self-awareness. It starts with self-assessment. It starts with, I don't know how to do something. Where can I go learn how to do it? And how will I know I learn how to do it or not? Right? Like that model fits in this pandemic very well. And I think that that's where we start. We start with this idea that we teach our students how to learn because it's one of the most important skills given how fast things change. My, my daughter, my oldest daughter has a degree in film. She got that degree four years ago. Think about what has happened in film with just technology in the last four years. The idea that she's done learning is insane. She has to continuously, continuously learn. And so learning and how to learn becomes the most important skill you can focus on. 
Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really important point you make because we often are focused on the undergraduate students in higher education, but they're also graduate students. In addition, there are opportunities for executive education, continued lifelong learning for our employees. Um, so I think that's another area that industry needs to focus on is this concept of lifelong learning and right. promoting uh, digital literacy among all the generations. And as right. we've seen, this is the first time in world history where we have about four generations all working together at the same time. So sure. it's important as we're moving into the next generation of technological advancement, we're into the fourth industrial revolution, that we are, are supporting all of our employees of all generations with digital literacy. That's right. Mm -hmm. Now, I wanted to ask you, coming from uh, you know, the concept or the, the perspective of Kazakhstan, we have a question here that was asked uh, from somebody who works in the corporate world. And he is wondering, you know, a lot of universities in Kazakhstan are um, less developed than much of the you know, developed, developed countries in terms of digital literacy education for their students, as well as the type of digital um, technology they have in the classroom, right? And in the workforce, that is also a challenge, but especially in the universities. So mm -hmm. in your experience in working with universities, governments around the world, where can countries in the emerging and developing country level, where can they start? You know, what would be most important? And also how can they get more funding and support for digital literacy technology? Yeah, so I think the funding question has to be country-based, right? Like, like it has to be a priority. It has to be, you know, it's funny. I, I hear from people all the time that they don't have funding for digital things. And then, you know, you go and look and they have a hundred, you know, millions of dollars worth of textbooks, right? So. So we have to rethink how we get information. We still think, you know, look, I look, I got a pile of books over there. I get it. But technically, I can find all that information online, right? For the most part. There's bits of that everywhere. So I think we need to rethink what learning looks like and where the resources are. And this back back to the idea of understanding how to learn. So so I think part of it is a, an investment in understanding that digitalization matters internet connectivity matters, access to the web matters, broadband speed matters in this future, it just does. And so I know, you know, it, technically on, at the macro level, at the macro level, it's a temporary problem, right? When I started at Google, I think it was like 14% of the world was online. By the time I left, it's 50%. So it's a temporary problem in, in the long term, but because the technology will get to the point and a lot of it has to do with you know, it's hard to drop fiber line in rural, rocky, remote areas, right? It's hard to set up electricity in some places, but I, I think that those problems will be solved over time. But I think that it has to be a fundamental investment. Like if you go to a school district in another country and, they, and you're like, how much do you spend on, on textbooks? And if they say, you know, I'm just making up numbers. They say $3 million. I don't, I don't, I don't know what that means. But if I said, okay, don't spend that money anymore. And instead, make sure your, band, your bandwidth is good. Make sure you have uh, laptops, at least Chromebooks for the students and make sure you have good connectivity and electricity. They're like, no, no, I still need to buy textbooks. That's what people expect. People expect textbooks. And so a lot of that is mind shift. A lot of that is changing your perspective on what is important. And, and it's so obviously clear, right? When I was 11 years old, you know, 100 years ago, and you asked me a question like, hey, do you know what happened on December 7th, 1941 in the US? And, I, and if I didn't know, I'd say, I don't know, but I'm gonna go find out and I will be back tomorrow. And it would literally take me a day to, I didn't have encyclopedias at home, so I had to go to the library where it closed at five o'clock in the afternoon. It wasn't open on the weekends. And if you went, it'd, it'd be full of people because it wasn't just my library, it was everyone's library. Eventually I'd get the information, I'd come back and I'd say, oh, Pearl Harbor happened on, 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 on that day. And I spent all that time answering that one question. Today, 
obviously you can get to that answer in microseconds. You don't even need to use your fingers. You can just ask, right? You can ask Google, you can ask Siri, you can ask Alexa, whatever you want to use. You can ask that question and the answer pops up. So what that does is that it shifts the conversation. So no, no longer is the question, what happened on the 7 7 1941 in the US? And I spent a day coming back and saying, oh, it was Pearl Harbor. That doesn't do anything. That just gives you an answer. But if you already have the answer, then the better question is, why did Pearl Harbor happen? And or could Pearl Harbor happen again? Now I'm spending a day answering that question. And that gets us to deeper thinking and that gets us to better problem solving. And that's the investment that we need to make when it comes to technology, right? So, so it's about our priorities. And I've been to countries in South America where I see stacked up textbooks because they have a contract because somebody took somebody out for lunch and sold them textbook. Like it's just, it's insane when I hear some of these arguments. Yeah, it's really interesting. I bet you have so many stories you could tell given your experience in many countries. Um, so we have a question here. They're asking specifically about Kazakhstan and, and where the country is at in the middle of this pandemic. The value of the tenge, the local currency, dropped about 30 percent during the Saudi-Iran oil dispute when the, you know, the coronavirus cases were rising. And then we had massive closure countrywide and worldwide. So really the economy has been completely hit by this situation. And a lot of people are seeing, uh, just as we're seeing in the United States and other places, massive job loss and economic uh, you know, recession for sure. We're already in a recession. And a lot of people in the workforce are looking to experts on how should we get out of this, especially in the case of Kazakhstan, you know, 1991, uh, they left the Soviet Union and have been transitioning ever since. And it's been a, a bit rocky, but also many, many things have been accomplished during that time very incredibly. So given that this person wants to know what it, where should Kazakhstan start, especially industry, what is the first thing they should focus on when it comes to the future of technology and supporting this global workforce. Yeah, and, and I think you're right, right? Lots of countries are dealing with this where everyone's in the same position. In the US, you have unemployment rates skyrocketing and all those things are true. But again, we got to look at this glass half full. And I think there's two things to focus on. Number one is a realization that our world is pretty screwed up in lots of different ways. Most importantly, um, around the environment, right? Like, like we keep pretending that things aren't happening and we keep having debates about climate change and we keep having debates about resources and we keep having debates about where things are headed. But if you look at the earth as a whole and compare it to where it was a hundred years ago, we are definitely heading in the wrong direction. And I think the environmental movement has gotten the message wrong completely. And the environmental movement has always been about save the planet, save the whales, save the beaches. And my position on this whole thing has been the beaches are fine. The, the oceans are fine. The, 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 the air pollution, that's fine. Because again, at the macro level, the earth is gonna be fine no matter what we do to it. You know, we can launch every nuclear bomb and a hundred million years from now, the earth will come back, it'll be fine. That just, that's how it was designed. So it's not about saving the earth, it's about literally saving ourselves. And I think if we look at that problem that way, then what are the solutions for that? And so I think that this huge opportunity that we're not even, that will come up, it, there's just no question about how are we going to feed people? How are we going to get clean water? How are we going to breathe air? Like those are big fundamental things. Like, you know, I, we walk around the world with our masks on and it's the most bizarre thing in the world. Like I, that, and we're comfortable now with it. Like, oh yeah, I got to get my mask and my five-year-old wears a mask. And I went out to lunch with somebody yesterday and we're wearing our mask and it just becomes a normal thing. And it's just the most insane thing to see us in masks. And that nobody's like, why are we wearing masks, right? Let's fix this. And, and so, 
can you, I can see, because of that, I can see a day where we're walking around with oxygen tanks on. And we're like, you know, we got big oxygen tanks because we can't breathe the air. And like, hey, how's it going? Good, yeah. All right, I'll see you next week. And then you put your oxygen tank back on. Like, I can totally see us doing that. That's probably not a good solution. So I think there's huge opportunity on, on, on in the green field, on creating um, energy efficient things, around making sure that we can save ourselves from these things that are coming our way. And the pandemic is part of this as well, right? And so that's number one. Number two is that because of the internet, because of the web, we now live in a long tail economy, right? When I was a kid and I wanted to start a business, I would have to find a storefront. I would have to lease it, rent it, buy it, whatever. I have to fix it up, set it up, you know, put all the shelves up, clean it up, get licenses, get all the things that I need. Then I had to go get inventory and stock all my, my shelves with stuff. And I would have to look at the community and ask my community what it was that they wanted me to stock the shelves with. I'd have to go through this whole process to start a business. Well, today, anyone with a laptop can start a business. I'm starting three right now. And that's an opportunity. That's a long tail economy where I can get very niche, right? So one of my businesses is going to focus around master classes and, and help and, and, and creating some content that I get out to people around the things that I know or getting experts to do master classes. That's one thing. Another one is around storytelling and helping organizations with storytelling. I can do all that from here with my laptop. And so we have to think about being very niche with the economy. I can find a target audience, right? Like, you know, I often joke about flat earthers and how much I love flat earthers and I am obsessed with them. And I love their theories and how they think about things and the way, the way they see the world. I watch their videos. If I was a really good t-shirt designer and I'm still not ruling this out as a potential business, but if I was a really good t-shirt designer, I can design two or three really cool flat earth t-shirts because they all their shirts are terrible. But I can design really good shirts and I know exactly where they are. I know what YouTube videos they watch. I know where they are on Instagram. I know their Facebook groups. I can micro target for 30, 40 bucks of ad revenue. I can target them. I can easily make $30,000 a year selling flat earth t-shirts. Like that's how niche we can get. There's 6 million of them in the world, right? So if 1% buy my t-shirts, I'm good for the year, right? So you have to think in that, in that micro nuanced way about the economy and what you can do with it. And so those two things, I think are areas that we need to, to, to dive deeper into. Completely agree. Yeah, very, very interesting perspective, Jaime. Thank you. Um, so I think we'll, we're towards the end of our time together today. This has been a really interesting discussion about the future of the digital workforce and in light of the pandemic. And so to kind of wrap up our discussion, I just have one final question to summarize everything, which would be uh, for everyone watching, what are the most important skills needed and ways industry can be support, best support and prepare the current emerging workforce coming from the global pandemic. So again, yeah. what are the most important skills needed and how can industry best support? Yeah, so, and we talked a little bit about this throughout this discussion, but it's those things that we talked about, problem solving, critical thinking, the ability to learn, um, creativity and collaboration, right? Those are the things, and I call those human skills. And we have been talking about this list and preparing students and the future workforce with this list for as long as I've been alive. Like we, we call them 21st century skills. Mm -hmm. We're 20 years into the 21st century and we're still talking about 21st century skills. And I think we like to say 21st century skills because it makes us feel like that's in the future. That's something that we have to worry about later. And to me, if you wanna trigger me, call those soft skills. They're not soft. They're absolutely 100% essential skills, critical skills that our students need, that our humans need, that our people need. Those are the things to focus on. And fundamentally what it comes down to, and if you, if you, if you want to rank them, again, number one is this idea of uh, of the ability to learn. That's the most important one. How do we teach our students how to learn? How do you hire people that know how to learn? Because 
when I when I'm gonna hire people for my company, the number one thing I'm gonna ask questions about or look into or find in uh, for my for people that are gonna come work for me is their ability to to learn. And I'm gonna want I don't want to look at resumes. I don't look at resumes. Resumes are history lessons. You know, resumes are history books. I don't care about your history. I care about your potential and and what you can do. And so what I'm gonna look for is a portfolio. What, what is your portfolio? And what I'm looking for in that portfolio isn't accomplishments or I sold $5.5 billion worth of stuff. Like I'm looking for, has this person grown? Because that's a great indicator of their ability to learn. Has this person not gotten better on one specific skill, but have they transferred those skills into other things? And so the ability to learn becomes the most important one. The second one to me is problem solving. And why problem solving, because of all the things that we talked about before, I don't ask students, for example, you know, what they want to be when they grow up. That's an old world question. I ask students instead, what problem do you want to solve? And that's one of my interview questions when I interview people. What's the problem that you want to solve? And the second question is, how do you want to solve it? How do you want to take your gifts, your talents, your experiences and solve that problem? And then the third question is, what do you need to know to solve that problem? What knowledge, skills, and abilities do you have to solve that problem? And what knowledge, skills, and abilities do you need to build to solve that problem? And so I think if we just focus on those two things, that the problem solving and the ability to learn, and you mentioned earlier, digital skills, which are absolutely critical for students. If we focus on that, that that'll keep us busy enough for, for, for a couple of years. <laughs> All right, awesome. So, you know, takeaways from this hour we had together discussing the future of business in Kazakhstan as it relates to uh, the digital future and the global workforce. Uh, you know, takeaways, as you just mentioned, is help people learn how to learn, right? And focus on what problems they can solve and the importance of both industry and universities, higher education in promoting digital literacy and promoting that this should be a, an ultimatum and a priority at the highest levels in our government and in industry associations, et cetera, of paramount importance, especially for developing and emerging economies, given that you know, there is a way to go, but also a huge opportunity, right? Because with emerging economies, they don't necessarily need to go through all these steps and stumbles that a place say like the US had to go through, right? They can bypass all of that and go to where we are at now, which is a really great opportunity. Right, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So good. Well, thank you so much, Jaime. Do you have any final thoughts you'd like to share with everybody today? No, I, I think that, I, I, look, I, I think we can look at the world as half, you know, a glass half full, a glass half empty, and maybe it's a combination of both. But for me, I see tons of opportunity. Like, you know, I, it's funny, I see all the businesses that are coming out of the pandemic, right? Like I even have one of those key things, right? The, the how to use it to touch elevator buttons and open doors, you know, like, I think businesses will emerge from this. Businesses are about solving problems, right? Because that's what business is about. It's about solving problems. Sometimes problems that you didn't even know you had, right? So, so I, I think that I am, I am optimistic about what we can accomplish. I think that everything that we're going through right now, in, no matter what industry you're in, no matter if it's personal, whatever it is that you're going through right now through this incredible year is an opportunity to reset. And I think that's where we are now is to reset, right? Like I haven't been on an airplane since the end of February. This is the longest I've been home since for 25 years. I traveled 300,000 miles a year. My wife's been on more airplanes than I have in the last couple of months. And so for me personally, I'm like, well, why do I need to travel so much, right? Like, so I think things can get reset. I think things can uh, we can look at things with a, okay, we, the economy was like going this fast and this was where we were. And at some point, you know, you're like, whoa, we had to take a step back, reevaluate things, redesign things, reformat things and figure out what are the important things on it. Yeah, I would agree. I think that the powers that be beyond humanity are telling us you need to reset, right? And, right. and so take this as an opportunity to reset for sure. Right. 
but yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Jaime. This has been a very enlightening, engaging conversation. We hope all of you watching have benefited from it. Jaime, do you have? Uh, I just wanted to say about? that you know, you, uh, if you have questions, my my message button on Twitter is open, so you can reach me on Twitter. I have my YouTube channel, you know, just my name, Jamie Cassip. You can reach me on YouTube. You're on YouTube already, so go to go to search bar, type my name in, find my channel and subscribe to the, the content that I put out there. And, and if you have any other questions or any follow-ups, let me know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Please continue to engage with Jaime. He's a great expert in this area. I think he'd be a, a benefit to any organization in Kazakhstan. So if you're wanting to expand your uh, trainings for your employees or even your students, if you're at a university, if you want to do some strategizing on how to start working on the things we've talked about today, Jaime is your expert. So connect with him. Also at Northwest University, we have continued learning opportunities for industry employees. We have executive education trainings. Um, so we invite you also to connect with Northwest if we can help develop a special training uh, for your organization. We can also do that in collaboration with Jaime as well. So we welcome you to Narcos University at any time. Uh, you know, one of Kazakhstan's leading universities really uh, we're working to change the, the mold of higher education in Kazakhstan to meet the needs of the current situations in the world. So look forward to all of you partnering with us. We also want to thank the executive education and the global offices at Narcos University who put on this series. This is the second in our futures of business in Kazakhstan series at Narcos University. We're going to be hosting uh, more experts. You can always catch the recordings of our live sessions on our YouTube channel. So make sure to look at those and uh, pass those along to all of your employees so they can benefit from these free and open trainings and discussions. And lastly, we want to thank the British Chamber of Commerce and the American Chamber of Commerce and all of the members that tuned in today to watch our session. So thank you again um, from Phoenix, Arizona, from Abu Dhabi United Arab, Arab Emirates and from Almaty, Kazakhstan. We wish you all the best during this time and that your family stays safe and healthy and happy. Thank you, everybody. Have a great night.